did my doctorate in Ghana and on Ghana uh, many years ago. And I was last here nearly 20 years ago. So it's great to be back in Ghana and to see how things have changed and moved on and so on. Let me just start by inviting you to bear in mind this image, slightly blurred image of Thomas More's Utopia, which uh, marked its 500th anniversary last year, 2016. And just observe that in, the, in coining the name, the term uh, Utopia, Thomas More was having a little joke. He, because Utopia means both no place, that is to say an, an impossible uh, society to attain, and also good place. So it, he was having a little uh, pun in the use of that term. Um, <clears throat> so just bear that in mind when you're listening to me perhaps. So I don't know, can you see these? It looks a little blurred, but anyway, this is a somewhat, uh, maybe a bit boring slide, but just reminding you last year of all the summits, uh, or at least some of the summits that took place supposedly to address the refugee and migration crisis, which our other speakers were, have been talking about. No less than seven major international summits culminating in the, the two summits in the US in September last year. And as you know, as, a, as you probably know, as a result of that, the UN is trying to steer the international community towards what they call global compacts on refugees and migrants, and that these are to be agreed by uh, the end of next year, 2018. And we're now a year into that process. And increasing skepticism, I think, is taking hold as to whether these compacts are going to have any real effect, despite all the energy and effort being put into them. Nor is there much uh, <clears throat> uh, confidence that the three so-called durable solutions, that is to say uh, uh, local integration in the society that refugees move to, uh, resettlement in another country further afield, or return to their homeland once conflict is over, there's not much confidence that uh, the, the so-called three durable solutions are up to the task in hand on the scale uh, that's needed. We're talking about 65 million people displaced uh, worldwide. There are all these uh, various lim limitations on the exercise of the uh, durable solutions, which, by the way, only affect a small proportion, or a small proportion of the displaced population are, are able to take advantage of the, the durable solutions. Most people uh, displaced are in so-called uh, protracted uh, situations of uh, displacement for years on end. Um, so against this uh, somewhat grim background perhaps, and of course the, the, perhaps the political limits are amongst the most prominent recently with the, the rise of illiberalism in Europe, North America and other places, Turkey and so on. Um, so against this background a number of uh, radical, not to say outlandish and sometimes bizarre uh, proposals have emerged that attempt to resolve refugee and migration challenges. And amongst these proposals are ideas for new nations, uh, cities, new city-states, free zones, and other kinds of haven uh, for, for refugees that have been proposed. And my colleague, uh, Robin Cohen, and I have kind of reviewed these sometimes bizarre outlandish proposals. And off, very often, the idea of islands come up in, in these proposals. So I've just put up a few of the examples here. And I'm going to focus, just in the interest of time, on the last one, uh, this Europe in Africa idea, perhaps the most bizarre and entertaining uh, example of, of these uh, ideas. So this Dutch architect, Theo Deutinger, proposes to build an artificial island, Ferruccio, in between Tunisia and Italy, <clears throat> on the shelf there, um, and to form essentially a new nation, a new island nation, uh, <clears throat> at this point that would accommodate people coming from 
uh, North Africa en route to uh, Europe. Neither they would move on or they would stay in this territory in his vision. It would have its own constitution, its own economy, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. <clears throat> and it would be under the protection of the European Union in this idea. And he's kind of uh, set up this kind of fantasy island uh, idea. I don't know if you can see it, but there are components of different cities, a bit of Oxford, uh, a bit of Timbuktu, uh, Casablanca, Berlin, um, <clears throat> and Rotterdam and so on. Bizarrely, London Airport, which I would not uh, recommend as the best bit of uh, London to have in its composite island. But maybe you get, get the idea. So, so these uh, ideas <clears throat> have, of course, been dismissed by, out of hand, really, by the refugee commentariat, the migrant the pe people like us, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, islands and enclaves have very bad press when we talk about uh, migration. Um, uh, it brings to mind Nauru, Manus Island, Christmas Island, Guantanamo Bay, and so on. Uh, examples or bringing associations of incarceration, uh, containment, uh, confinement, and so on. But we, Robin Cohen and I, we sort of thought we'd review these different ideas and see if, in fact, there was anything in them. And what we've come up with is a, a rather different uh, <coughs> idea, a transnational polity which we call uh, refugia. Hence the title. Um, so refugia would not be a new uh, nation state located on an island or other kind of singular territory, but a transnational polity, which we see, see as emerging from the connections built up by refugees and migrants themselves with the help of sympathizers. And it would be kind of confederal in character and perhaps the best analogy uh, is with a loosely connected archipelago, not literally an archipelago, but a met metaphorical archipelago that brings together refugee communities in territories in conflict, those neighboring conflicts uh, and in, or in transit countries and refugees in more distant countries of settlement. As we see it, and we, we call this an exercise in pragmatic utopianism, that's what we would like to call it, Refugia would be the outcome of a grand bargain between richer states and emergent uh, countries, countries neighboring conflicts, and crucially, refugees themselves. So the constituent territories of refugia would in effect be licensed or tolerated by the nation states within whose territories they lie. <clears throat> Uh, the constituent components of refugia would be self-governing and eventually self-supporting. And refugia as a whole would be governed by a transnational virtual assembly elected by refugians from all the constituent components of the global polity. There would be mobility amongst the different components of, of parts of refugia. So some refugians might uh, live in discrete territories or spaces. Others could live side by side with citizens, especially in large met metropolitan cities. Moreover, and this is a key point, the citizens of so-called host uh, territories and societies could become refugians if they wish. So we envisage people from host societies somehow in the same way that's happening now with volunteer activism and so on, joining to make this new community. What about the economy? Well, this would be built on the skills of refugians in digital commerce and services, cultural and creative industries, education, and other fields. Refugians would pay taxes to the nation states within which they live, uh, within whose territories they live, I should say, but also to the wider refugee polity. And a portion of that latter revenue, that contribution to the wider polity, would, be, would provide support to less well-endowed parts of refugee. So there would be a means of cross 
subsidy among the differently endowed parts of refugee. So the upshot would be that refugees would no longer be primarily the responsibility of the nation state that so-called hosts them, but of a more diffuse uh, entity, refugee. It would be a pragmatic arrangement uh, which can be seen as a kind of secession uh, by mutual agreement. So we see uh, for, that for their part, states would see it as uh, in their interest to shuffle off the displacement problem to be managed by the displaced themselves, while the displaced and those seeking an alternative to illiberal, illiberal societies would relish the prospect of a self-managed uh, new society that they create themselves. Now, I guess I know what you're thinking. What the hell is this guy from Oxford going on about utopias and islands and transnational polities and so on? What, what, you know, what on earth is this all about? So it's, it's utterly utopian in the sense of it's impossible, right? So now I'm going to strain your credulity further and suggest to you that refugia already exists. And it exists in the... Uh, uh, in pre prefigurative, highly imperfect form, especially in the transnational practices of refugees and migrants themselves. And let me try to make the case for this argument. So, um, <clears throat> I, I've done that, sorry. So in uh, countries that have long hosted large numbers of uh, refugees and will likely do so in the future. Some of them have been already mentioned, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, Iran, Pakistan in Middle East and South Asia, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda uh, in Africa, amongst many others. In the, these, uh, these places, refugees have uh, established tenuous communities against the odds of challenging conditions and poor prospects. And as you know, we've, again, we've already heard these, pe these populations have links with more fortunate kin and friends in global cities further afield, not just in the neighborhoods of New York, London, uh, Berlin, Toronto, and so on, but also in emergent uh, uh, countries, places like Istanbul, Cairo, Nairobi, Johannesburg, uh, Delhi, Bangkok, and so on, and many others in the emerging, so-called emerging world, where people of diverse uh, ethnicities and backgrounds are thrown together. Indeed, in some cases, the diasporic populations in metropolises outside the homeland are as large or larger than the populations in the so-called homeland. So, for example, one population that I know, one diaspora that I know quite well, the Sri Lankan Tamil uh, diaspora, uh, in uh, Toronto, the Tamil population is at least double that of Jaffna, which is the capital of, uh, of the Tamil part of, of Sri Lanka, the, the cultural capital, if you like. So, and one could say that this of many, that the center of gravity of many uh, diasporized populations is uh, of this kind. So, in other words, these diaspor diasporic communities already inhabit the kind of transnational space that we envisage as refugee. So taken together, people in these dispersed locations constitute mutually supportive transnational communities uh, through their uh, uh, transnational connections, their diasporic connections. Transnationalism is what uh, displaced and dispersed people do to make a life uh, worth living. As for governance, uh, several diaspora groups have created transnational bodies uh, that could serve as partial uh, models of governance for refugee. And in some cases, they've held uh, transnational virtual or transnational elections to uh, feed into these representative bodies. So again, taking the Tamil case, the Tamil, the Tamil diaspora has set up what they call a, a transnational government of Tamil Elam, that's the name for their homeland, and that has involved uh, elections in, say, about 15 countries where there are substantial uh, Tamil populations held uh, electronically and electing an assembly uh, of uh, Tamils worldwide. 
As for finance, I've already made reference to uh, remittances by refugees uh, to their um, troubled homelands and regions, in effect a form of global uh, redistrib redistribution of wealth, uh, uh, akin to taxation, I suppose, in a way, kind of redistribution, which uh, Sean referred to. Proto-refugia also exists in the realm of culture, seen in the transnational mobility of art, music, dance, dance, language, and support. And a little example here, if you remember, um, the uh, refugee team was recognized at the Rio Olympics in 2016. A very modest step in the big picture, but a tacit recognition of a body of people outside the nation state, uh, outside of uh, nation state affiliation. And we can find many other examples of the way in which refugee is uh, prefigured. Um, the ideas of refugee cities, sanctuary cities, free ha havens. There are miniature examples which are, I'll just highlight a couple of these. One is uh, the notion of a, a city of refuge in Barcelona, now of course in turmoil, but its progressive mayor uh, set in motion a series of measures to uh, welcome uh, refugees. <clears throat> So, but we can go down to the, to the miniature or the micro level too, um, with some very interesting uh, uh, developments. So for example, Riace is, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, a small uh, depopulated place in southern Italy, um, where at the invitation of a progressive-minded mayor, about 450 migrants drawn from more than 20 countries, including many African countries, have been uh, housed in accommodation, actually abandoned uh, apartment blocks there. So they now make up about a quarter of the village's total population and have breathed life into what was a declining, depopulating uh, community. Also significant are uh, what have been or, or uh, cross cross ethnic and cross national uh, affinities that have um, emerged among people on the move, and a couple of Greek scholars, uh, Dimitri Papadopoulos and Nikos Tsianos, have come up with the idea of the mobile commons uh, to describe this, and by this they mean uh, activities. Uh, which um, bring together migrants and refugees drawn from different nationalities and ethnicities into to form ephemeral communities. So examples include the uh, gatherings of refugees and migrants at choke points uh, that to form temporary settlements um, with the help of supportive citizens, such as the, the jungle camp at Calais, now defunct, Ventimiglia on the France-Italy border, uh, or Idomeni camp on the border between Greece and Macedonia. These communities uh, that formed uh, ephemerally uh, at these choke points of, on the migration routes. While often squalid and uh, liable to uh, demolition and arrest, uh, state oppression and so on, these kinds of community creation and reproduction uh, through mutual aid among uh, migrants en route, uh, aided by uh, concerned host citizens, we suggest uh, constitute imperfect prototypes of, of uh, refugee. And an another small example, Hotel Oniro is a, um, an abandoned hotel in Athens that was occupied by activists and migrants and is now home to about 200 refugees who manage it themselves with the help of those activist citizens. And perhaps appropriately, the, the, the word Oniro derives from the Greek to dream. So back to utopia. So um, camps and communities in uh, countries neighboring conflicts, neighborhoods in global cities, transnational political practices and money transfers, emergent communities and act, uh, act, activities in disparate locations en route, initiatives by citizens and community groups, all are fragments uh, in disparate locations that taken separately don't seem to promise much. 
But in the aggregate, we suggest, they add up to something like refugia imperfectly prefigured. And consolidating them into a common transnational polity might prove to be a way out of the current impasse. So in our vision, our utopian vision, our pragmatic utopian vision, refugia will come about incrementally and cumulatively by the collective activity of refugees and sympathetic citizens organizing in the interstices of the nation-state system and in the international uh, migration governance architecture. So refugia will be essentially uh, self-organized and self-managed, uh, requiring neither political nor cultural conformity, but simple agreement on principles and deeds of mutual aid. So critics will no doubt uh, dub this vision utopian, in fact they already do, and we accept that uh, jibe, if you like, that with the qualification that refugia embodies this pragmatic utopianism which squares the apparently uh, contradictory and at times antagonistic interests of host states and refugians. So, viva refugia!